Whether you knew the man's direct work or not, if you watch Doctor Who and you like it, then you owe this man a huge debt of thanks. So folks, uh, about a, a little more than a week ago at the time that this video will go out, uh, we have lost Terence Dix. Terence Dix was a British writer, uh, worked on many things. He worked on the British TV show The Avengers, he worked on Space 1999, but for the purposes of this channel, and for most of my audience, he worked on Doctor Who. He was the script editor. He held that position longer than anybody else. And even if you don't know the name Terrence Dix, allow me to explain to you why Doctor Who would not be what it is right now without him. So this is not going to be a full in memoriam, you know, rundown of the man's entire life. I'm I'm not that good. I'm not that thorough uh, at research, and I wouldn't honestly know how to present it. So I am going to be focusing on his Doctor Who work. But obviously, he was a man who lived a full life and worked on many things, both before and after. So don't take that as the end all be all his end all be all contribution to popular culture. But it is what I'm going to focus on today. So let's start by explaining what the script editor even was. Because it's a position that technically still exists, but what it is now, uh, at least in regards to Doctor Who and how that show was run, is not what it was at the time he held the position. So basically, the showrunner position for Doctor Who as it exists now, and that's a position that's been held by Russell T. Davies, Stephen Moffat, and currently Chris Chibnall. That position is basically a marriage of what had previously been two positions during the classic era, that of the producer and the script editor. Now, the producer was in charge of the show overall. The script editor actually got stuck in at the script level, hounded the writers to be sure that they were getting their scripts in on time, that their ideas were any good, massaged them if needed. And that was especially important back in the classic era because those were all multi-part stories. So it was really important that you had somebody to be on top of the writers, you know, because if a writer's supposed to do a six-part story, you really need somebody kind of, you're, you're depending on them to produce not just one good script, but six good scripts. You need somebody on top of them to make sure everything is coming together. Or the way Terrence Sticks himself would put it, you know, I'd have people like Terry Nation tell me, oh, I'll have all six scripts for you uh, in a few weeks. And I'd say, no, Terry, you're going to give me one script right now so I can look at it and make sure where you're going makes any kind of sense. You're not just going to dump a finished story that may need fixing on me. That was who Terrence Dix was, and that's what he did. He also did a lot of writing of individual episodes. He, the, his first credited writing, he did some uncredited script work, but his first credited writing was for The War Games, the epic 10-part final story for Patrick Troughton. He helped create The Master. He helped create the entire idea of the Time Lords. He wrote Tom Baker's first ever, script, first ever story, Robot. He wrote the first two multi-doctor ones, the three doctors and the five doctors. He had a massive, tangible impact on the show. But the thing that may be the most lasting impact of anything he did was something that I think viewers my age and younger may not know and definitely certainly wouldn't fully appreciate. And I didn't either until I dug a little bit more into him. And that is what were called the target novelizations. It used to be that Doctor Who episodes would be published in, in the form of novels that were basically retelling the 
the serials that they were based off of. Terrence Dix wrote over 60 of those in really the, the heyday of it. And eventually, you know, other people came in. Eventually, uh, the, the people who wrote the original screenplay that they were based off of wanted to be the ones to write the novelizations because they, they got more money that way. Um, but the target novelizations... Again, if you're my age or younger, it's hard to understand the importance of these. Because what you need to realize is that when Doctor Who, when classic Doctor Who was airing, the 60s, the 70s, even into the 80s, these things weren't being rerun. And in the case of the classic stuff, they weren't even being saved, a lot of it. If you missed the original airing, you didn't see it possibly ever and home video wasn't really a thing at all until the 80s and wasn't affordable as a thing most people had until late into the 80s into the 90s so the way for a lot of people to either get to experience a story they didn't see because they missed it or because it aired before they were born or if they wanted to re-experience a serial that they have seen, but it's not going to air again, was the target novelizations. That's what existed instead of home video. And the reason that's important is because more than a few prominent Doctor Who writers of the modern era have said in interviews and to Terrence Dix when he was still alive, that his novelizations of those stories were a very big part of what got them as invested in Doctor Who as they were. Now, it be an overstatement to say that like we wouldn't have modern Doctor Who at all because one imagines that if the novelizations were lucrative, they would have happened anyways. But they were in the hands of a man who knew this world and knew this character and knew how to write them and was a, a writer from all indications that I can find who didn't have a massive ego. He was a working writer. He was willing to work with whatever he was given. Actually, one of the, I, I, I watched some interviews with him. One of the things he said about coming in to be the script editor for the Pertwee era was that he had to come in and deal with, with several massively bad ideas. The fact that the Doctor was now stuck on Earth. He said it was a massively bad idea. And at the time that um, Pertwee started, they were doing longer serials. Instead of like four and six parters, they were doing like seven or eight parters. And he also said that was a very bad idea. But he did it. He made it work because that was his mandate. And he did what he could with it while currently reminding guys, hey, you know, be better if we didn't do this. Be better if we could change this. Could you let me nudge it, nudge it, nudge it, and then get it to where he wanted it. But he was a writer who would work with what he had. So he didn't have this huge massive ego, but that meant that he would get these scripts to adapt into novelizations. And he would recognize when what he was handed was terrific. I, again, in some of the interviews I saw, he particularly cited uh, Kinda and uh, I don't, and uh, Snake Dance because he thought those concepts were really fascinating. He also said he quite enjoyed working on scripts for serials that weren't very good because it gave him a chance to help them and make them work better. You know, if the effects were lousy on on the show, he'll just describe those effect scenes really good on the page and suddenly they work so much better. Or if there's a massive plot hole that snuck through, he has the chance to fix it in the novelization. But again, not because he thought, I can do this better. He's like, this is a better way to tell a story. That's what the guy did. And you can find quite a bit on him. You can find interviews with him and pretty much any interview with him is going to be primarily about Doctor Who. I remember my first impression of Terrence Dix was in the supplementary material, I believe on The Time Warrior, which he didn't write, but I, he was still the script editor at, at the time. And he, 
<laughs> Moaning about the inclusion of Sarah Jane. He didn't like Sarah Jane initially. He didn't like the mandate of the Doctor's companion having more agency and um, being in a position to kind of rescue herself at any point because he, he said flat out, the Doctor's assistant, because they were called the assistants there, back in that era more, the Doctor's assistant, their job is to scream and get rescued. Which, I mean, I'm not usually one to give a pass for, you know, think of the someone's age and the time that they were brought up, but I kind of do for that. And I kind of find it kind of adorable, especially because he still worked with the character that he was given. And as a script writer, he was told, you know, this is what this new character is going to be. And he may not have thought it was a good idea, but he still implemented it. And he still made sure that it was working for what the direction of the show was going under the various producers that he worked for. And, and again, even when he, even in that little snippet, that behind the scenes snippet where he was bemoaning Sarah Jane, he was saying it with a smile. He was like, yeah, I didn't think this was a good idea, but what do I know? It was just kind of his his attitude and his notion. And he did a lot to steer this show. Like I said, he was a creative force behind things like The Time Lords, The Master, the entire feel of the Pertwee era as a whole, and continuing the legacy of those stories and other ones since by doing the target novelizations and picking that back up again. He did a target novelization for the first, uh, based off the very first story of the Sarah Jane adventures. Shows you that he kind of got over his Sarah Jane issues. Uh, he, he just kept writing. And he kept coming back to Doctor Who. He wrote a stage play, which he also didn't think was a very good idea. But he's like, well, okay, let's see what we can do with it. Uh, he had to do the, the last minute, several last minute changes to, uh, to the five doctors. Because initially writing it, finished his first draft, thought Tom Baker was going to be in it. Oh, whoops. <laughs> and then figuring out how to make that work. And again, not talking about it, like, in, in, again, I, I watched a number of interviews, not talking about it as if it was this massive thing that he had to deal with. He's like, I kind of like the pressure. And you're going like, okay, how do we fix this? Somebody that game to just get to work. I have to admire that. And he seemed to be very proud of his time and his work on Doctor Who. And... I'm going to miss him. I mean, he hasn't been an active force on the show for some time, but his influence is, is going to be felt for a long, long time. Like I said, the massive creative forces behind the reboot, the target novelization was a big part of their formative years of loving Doctor Who at all. And it's arguable that the show may not have remained, or at the very least, some of the earlier eras of the show may not have remained in the public conscience the way they did if it were not for the novelizations, if it were not for the things that he wrote. Terrence Dix, you will be missed. What is your favorite story either about Terrence Dix or that he wrote? Whatever your thoughts are, drop something down in the comments. Let's talk about it. A whole bunch of things to do because there are buttons and links and you can support me on Patreon, help me cover my bills, and hopefully one day uh, grow the channel even bigger and better than it already is. Other links down there besides. Because, you know, there's the stuff you know, like, subscribe, hey, 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 but also there's my social media links, there's my book. Click on things. Or don't. You don't have to. At the end of the day, you're the council, I'm just running the meetings, and until next time, this council is adjourned.